Steve is, he hasn't been here in the church since we transitioned out of our ministry phase into our church phase. But in these years through doing LDP1 and LDP2 with Steve, from on the other side of the country, he has been a spiritual father. He doesn't even realize it. He's been a spiritual father to this house. And we have been able to receive from him. And Wendy has been such a blessing to this place in our last two women's conferences. And people have just been wrecked and, and blessed by what God does through her. But it's very rare that we get to say we get the opportunity and the blessing to have relationship with such great people. He has been a blessing to us. And he will be a blessing to you. So I want you to open up your hearts and just receive everything that Papa has for you out of Steve and Wendy tonight. Let's stand up and give them a great big hand clap as they come. We love them. We're glad that they're here. to be back. Yes, amen. How many of you uh, have been here when Wendy has been here in the last couple of years? Anybody experienced her? Man, I had to come here and just see what all the fun is. She's been, she's been so blessed to be with you, and it's good to be back. It's good to be back, Jacob and Heather. Thank you. Hope Church. We can, we can come into agreement with that. By the way, un unreasonable optimism is going to be released this weekend. <laughs> unreasonable optimism. Wendy and I, we're, we're not into positive thinking. We're into biblical optimism. People who made a difference in the Bible were unreasonably optimistic. How many of you know David was unreasonably optimistic going after Goliath? The experts, by the way, let's just laugh at the experts. Yeah. <laughs> the, ex, the experts said, that's not, that's not wise. That's not a good decision. Let's laugh at that too. <laughs> you know, we're, not, we're into biblical optimism. We're into he Hebrews 10, 23, where it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. It says, don't let go of being an incessant hope speaker and do it without wavering. How many of you know that's, that's, uh, that's pretty clear? And then it, then it says, it says, why? For he who promised is faithful. The reason that it, does, it doesn't say let us hold fast the thought of our hope, which is a good idea, but it says let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And I'm in the room tonight, you know, and I sense it and in worship. By the way, anybody appreciate worship tonight? Yeah, it was, uh, got, got into the last half of that, and that, that wow, thank you, Lord. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here with a group of radicals. I mean, you're, if you're here Friday night, you're either serious about God or somebody serious brought you. <laughs> Because <laughs> you're not here on a Friday night to get a check mark after your name saying, yes, amen, I did my religious duty, I was in charge. Yep, let's laugh at that too. <laughs> I just want to clarify, when we talk about hope, a lot of times in certain churches, you know, they think, oh yeah, you know, there's hope in Jesus, you know, when I die or something. But we're talking about actually a lifestyle of hope. You know, for every situation, for everything in our life, that there is hope that you can change, others can change, your circumstances can change. You know, and when God first started talking to us about that, my first thought was, I don't know, God. You know, let's be real. There are some things that aren't, you know, don't, they're, they're hopeless, right? And he just made a deal with me, and it's worked really well. He just said, Wendy, you have permission to be hopeless about anything I'm hopeless about. <laughs> <laughs> so far, <laughs> I, I've discovered he's not called the God of hope for no reason. Evidently, he knows who he is and what he can do. <laughs> And then the other thing that I really had to get over was just the, the fear of being disappointed. What if I'm hoping 
and I get disappointed again. And he said, well, you can have a lifestyle of hopelessness or you can have a lifestyle of hope with occasional disappointment. Mm -hmm. You know, a hopeless life wasn't that much fun anyway. <laughs> All it did was it drained you of the ability to actually handle your circumstance. But hope actually gives you energy. It's the most amazing thing when it's true hope. I'm not talking about working up an emotion of hope. I'm talking about going after the truths of God because all hope has to be based on a belief system. And so to have hope, you actually have to change what you believe. <laughs> Sometimes that's harder to do than, you know, sacrificing your time. I mean, I have to sacrifice this belief system that I can't do that. I have to sacrifice my belief system that I'll never change. Yikes. <laughs> mm. Why don't you repeat this after me? Um, by the way, Jacob, I loved your declarations. Man, that declarations over the offering. That thing. Whew, that got, that got me caught up in a spiritual jet stream. <laughs> Why don't you repeat this after me? Uh, say, God brought me here tonight. Because he believes in me. More than I believe in myself. He's preparing me. For something bigger than I know. I'm a key player in worldwide revival. Something's happening in me tonight. It's going to increase, and I'll never be the same again. Amen. One of my favorite testimonies, and Wendy may have shared this, is uh, I've got one of my interns from last year, Ben Winkley. Ben, why don't you just wave there in the front? And he, he and Sanjay are going to, they're, they're two students from the School of Supernatural, Reading, who are with us tonight, and they're going to minister when we're done. And uh, I had an intern a couple years ago, his name was Levi, and he's from Oregon, and Levi loved to share the gospel with people personally. But if he shared the gospel with people and, and they would say they're an atheist, he would move into non-victorious belief systems and actually believe his past experience and his feelings that he was ineffective in ministering to atheists. By the way, let's just laugh at that. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm going to explain in a little while why I like to laugh at lies and, and it, until I explain that. Until I explain that, when I say let's just laugh at that, just give me a faith laugh. <laughs> and so he, he, he believed that he was ineffective and didn't have hope, you know, in ministering atheists. And, and one of our core beliefs, which we'll probably get into tonight, is in any area where we don't have great hope, we're believing lies. Our, our hope level is the indicator of whether we're believing lies or truth. So he said, you know, I got to believe something different. So it, if someone, he got a plan, so if someone would say there is an atheist when he was sharing the gospel, he would say this, oh really, that's so exciting, God always shows up when I'm around an atheist. <laughs> How many of you know you, you, you can't think a lie when you're speaking the truth? So he's in the UK a, couple, a few years ago and he's He's uh, sharing, he sees a group of teenagers in a park, and he says something like this. He says, uh, hi, I'm from America. I got some really good news. Jesus Christ loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And so there's a girl who's obviously the leader of the group. She says this, I'm an atheist. We can laugh at that, too. <laughs> and Levi says, oh, Really? That's so exciting because God always shows up when I'm around an atheist. <laughs> so he's, he's talking to them for a while, and he asked, um, any of you want to feel God? And they said, yes. So he says, put your hands out in front of you and say, Holy Spirit, come. Guess what Holy Spirit did? He came. He came. <laughs> 
atheist girl has tears coming down her eyes. And, and, and she and the whole group prayed to receive Jesus in their heart that day. A whole other group of teenagers got led to the Lord in that park. And I was talking to a pastor um, two months after that, and he said that day in the park rocked their school. And it, it happened because someone said, I'm going to believe something different. I'm actually not going to believe my past. I'm not going to believe my feelings. I'm going to believe something different. I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe truth. And because he believed that, he transformed his future into God always showing up when he was around atheists, and people got saved as a result. Somebody say, wow. wow. <laughs> so we actually like to take things like that and use it in everyday life. You know, whatever it is that you go through where you feel the spirit of heaviness or failure, you're, you're remembering your past when you're about to do something, start a new belief system. When I have to speak in front of people, God always shows up. When I have to do finances, God always shows up. When you do a red-eye flight, God, God always, always shows, shows He always up. shows up. Yes. So exciting. what we believe affects our body and it even affects how we how we interact and how people receive from us you know I, I when we were singing that song when when you walk into the room and um, Steve laughingly said when you walk into the room too and so I, I just started thinking <laughs> you know, we not only need to know what happens when God walks into the room but what walk, what happens when you walk into the room Hmm. People can never be the same again. Revival breaks out when I walk into the room. Start believing radically different stuff instead of, you know, I mean, if the stuff you're already believing is working for you, then that's fine. <laughs> but if you're like most of us, you would like to see some different results. And it's not about trying harder. It's about just getting some new belief systems. You know, the belief systems that got you into your current circumstances will not get you out of your current circumstances. Wow, that's good. So we actually have to go after, okay, what, do, what should I believe? And, you know, I was really challenged because I always thought, well, I need to believe what past experience and feelings have told me. I can't, you know, I'm not organized. How can I believe anything else than that? And then God said, well, how can you be disorganized when the God who created the universe lives in you? And he said, if you actually will start declaring and believing that you are organized, something shifts. You actually open up the ability for organization. I know for me, I really didn't want to start declaring I was organized because then I thought people would want me to start doing administrative stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good excuse, you know. Uh, no, I'm not organized. You don't want me to do that. <laughs> but we can't let our fear of, of getting in over our head stop us and limit us. It doesn't mean God's going to all of a sudden put you in an administrative role because that's not what makes you come alive. It just means that you're going to be able to do what makes you come alive in a more effective manner. Yep, somebody has been saying the words, I'm not administrative. By the way, let's laugh at that. Yeah. Uh, and even tonight, the Lord is just saying, he's, he's breaking, his grace is helping you break that off of you. It's actually limiting. It's not true. Your experience may say it's true, but it's not true. You're, you're, you're an organized person who often has disorganized experiences. <laughs> but you don't get your beliefs out of your experience. Because you get your beliefs out of your experience, you, you create the biggest stronghold. Th that, those things create the biggest stronghold to block the purposes of God. So we wrote a book, uh, you know, uh, based on Levi's testimony. Oh, really, that's so exciting. God always shows up when. And you fill in the blank. And we've got 50 areas. Your house is a mess when people come over. Oh, really? That's so exciting. <laughs> God always shows up when your house is a mess and people come over. Woo! Yes! Yes! Woo! 
<laughs> Amen. You gain more weight than you thought? Oh, really? That's so exciting. God always shows up when you gain more weight than you thought. Your adult ch child is making very poor decisions? Oh, really? That's so exciting. God always shows up when your adult child is making very poor decisions. A politician whose uh, beliefs oppose yours just got elected? Oh, really? That's so exciting. God always shows up when a politician who, whose beliefs oppose yours just got elected. I want to give this to the guy right here, with, right there. Yes, sir. What's your name? Quentin? Yeah, Quentin. You know, I just, I just saw over you, Quentin. I saw you're a mighty overcomer. I see the Lord is turning your past to good. And I'm seeing your ministry is actually coming out of, you know, things of your past. It's already, he's already been doing such powerful things, but it's going to increase. And I see you have an unusual ability to help people who are going through crisis and, and difficulty to actually think and see that differently. And so we bless you, Quentin. Yes. <laughs> All right, so when we minister, we love to have um, people do two things. We like to have people laugh at things, and we like to have people say things. Now, we'll probably speak more tomorrow night about saying things, and, and we may, may share a little bit about that tonight, but we like to have people laugh at things. And by the way, I want you guys to just warm up your laughers a little bit. <laughs> you just <laughs> warm them up, because uh, I wouldn't want anybody here to laugh suddenly and pull a laugh muscle. <laughs> we gotta gotta get it. It's actually pretty warm here already today, but just in case. Um, um, Wendy and I, we used to be uh, joy impaired, laughter impaired Christians, and we got delivered. Someone was crying in church. We'd go, "Oh yes, Amen. God is moving," <laughs> and He probably was moving. But if someone was uh, laughing in church, we'd say, we'd be troubled, and we'd say, that's not right. All things must be done decent and in order. <laughs> and then Holy Spirit said, yes, Steve, cemeteries are decent and in order. <laughs> that's a good point, Lord. Maybe, maybe your definition of decent and in order is not the same as mine. He said, uh, you want to be strong? I said, yes. He said, my joy is your strength. Nehemiah 8.10. I have a theory that our spiritual load-bearing capacity is in direct proportion to the level of joy in our lives. I have a theory that our spiritual load-bearing capacity is in direct proportion to the level of joy in our lives. It says in Psalm 100, I believe it's verse 2, it says, serve the Lord with what? Gladness. I believe when, we, we, when we've let go of gladness in a ministry assignment, we've hit the lid of our ministry influence. And I'm not saying ha you're having a bad day or a bad week. I'm just saying if you've consistently let go of gladness in a ministry assignment, I believe you've hit the lid of your ministry influence. And, and even in these meetings, the Lord, by the way, these meetings are about you. They're about you. They're about your personal breakthrough. Tonight and tomorrow morning, these meetings are about your breakthrough. By the way, just say, I'm going to get breakthrough. Uh, yeah. And I just, I, I just see that. And, 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 and there's going to be people who are, are going to get massive breakthrough in joy. So the Lord said, Steve, you want to be healthy? I said, yes. Showed me Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart is good like what? medicine. So Dr. God says, Steve, I have a prescription for you. I want you to laugh heartily three times a day. By the way, let's just laugh at that. <laughs> and science has caught up with the Bible again and proven that laughter benefits your health. We got a book back there called Possessing Joy. It's the biblical basis for the joy-filled life. Uh, it's a devotional or an eight-week Bible study. And in it, we, we share about scientific studies that have proven that laughter builds up your immune system to fight off disease. 
that laughter releases endorphins in your body, which is the natural painkiller. That laughter actually creates cells that fight off cancer. That laughter actually, it strengthens your heart. There's no known side effect, negative side effects for laughter. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of benefits. It, it says in, in Romans 14, 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not about meat and drink, but about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So joy is one-third of the kingdom. Joy is one-third of the kingdom. Somebody just go, hmm, hmm. Now, it's one-third of the kingdom. I got saved in 1975. I was a hippie. Let's just laugh at that. Uh, actually had hair. Uh, 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 uh. And, and I could probably count the first 15 years, 16 years of my Christian life on one hand, how many messages I heard on joy. And I believe the reason for that is because under a religious mindset, it's impossible to be joyful. Matter of fact, if you are joyful, it means you're not getting it. Because if you got it, you wouldn't be so happy. If you'd got it, you'd understand God has just about had enough of you. You prayed one hour, you should have prayed two. You fasted for three days, but you ate a marshmallow on day two. <laughs> and, That's and, the voice of experience. <laughs> yes. And now, and now God is angry with you. <laughs> That's how the religious mindset thinks, because... The religious mindset believes that God is more concerned about our performance than our relationship or our beliefs. And I, I think, you know, somehow in our culture, we have thought that if we're happy, it means we don't care about the things that are going wrong. You know, I always thought worry meant, you know, I care. But actually... Worry means I don't think there's a solution. Or having joy in the midst of the thing means that I'm already celebrating because I know I'm coming out okay. And so it's just such a big thing to actually realize, you know, what has robbed us of our joy? You know, and a lot of it is a misconception. And God's really not up there worrying. He is a happy God. If joy is one-third of the kingdom, it means that there's a lot of joy going on. And I always kind of just thought, well, I'll be happy as soon as the circumstances change. And uh -huh. he said, well, where are you going to get your strength to go through that circumstance if it comes from joy? And it, you know, I used to always think, well, I'm joyful on the inside. You know? <laughs> 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 And I would just think, that's not my personality to be ha, 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 you know, type thing. And God finally just said, you know, that's not true. There's no health benefits to laughing on the inside. Come on. Come on. And unless you actually release the joy, it doesn't continue to build and do anything within you. And for a long time, it was like, yeah, but it just sounds so fake when I laugh, so I don't want to laugh out loud. And he said, it's not fake, it's rusty. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, if, if that's you out there, it's just rusty. You know, that's like saying when you're trying to use a muscle you haven't used in a long time and you're lifting a weight, oh, this is so fake. No, uh -huh. you just haven't used it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> And so, you know, it's just radically changed our life to value joy. And to value, you know, you don't make time for what you don't value. So the first thing is, is to actually begin to value your joy. And one of the really cool benefits of valuing your joy is you won't sell it as cheaply. Because I used to let my joy, joy go for stupid reasons. You know, you get cut off in the traffic and, you know, there goes your joy. 
And actually, there was your whole day. <laughs> but just deciding, I'm not selling my joy. Because my joy is my strength for today. And so it, it just really makes you more conscious of where you're losing it and how to gain it back. Just say, uh, my joy is my strength. A religious mindset, by the way, religion celebrates perfection, but families celebrate progress. The spirit of religion only can become joyful when there's perfection, but families celebrate progress. We, we have six grandchildren, and remember when our oldest, Caden, was learning to walk, our daughter, Heidi, would send us texts, and she would just say this, he took a step, when, and I would, oh, he took a step, woo yeah, Caden took a step, this is so exciting, our grandson took a step, and, but Heidi never texted us, uh, he fell down again. He's such a disappointment to us. <laughs> he, he's an embarrassment to our family. Because <laughs> he tried to walk, and he couldn't walk. That's how, you know, by the way, you know, if parents were like many Christian leaders, <laughs> Here, here's what they would do. When their toddler is trying to walk and, and is not doing it very well and falling down, they would say this. <clears throat> Quit trying to walk. You're just being presumptuous and prideful. <laughs> it's obvious that God has not given you the gift of walking. Because <laughs> if you had the gift of walking, it wouldn't be so hard. <laughs> and besides, if you had the gift of walking, you'd already be walking. And because you're not walking right now, it means God didn't want you to have the gift of walking. Yep, let's laugh at that. Uh, God in his sovereignty has predestined you with the gift of crawling. Be content with how God made you. <laughs> That's how the religious mindset thinks, because, you know, religion is always looking for perfection. You're not doing that well. You don't have the gift of healing. They weren't healed. That means you don't have the gift. Let's laugh at that. Uh, uh, uh. That's why I love cultures like this where, you know, you actually, you encourage trying things. None of us are going to walk perfectly in, in what we're called to do, you know, right away. And, and, and that's just... And so we get excited. You tried. You went out. You shared with people, but uh, it didn't seem to work. And you, they got angry. Woohoo! Yes. <laughs> you know, the problem with getting our identity from our past is that we use it to confirm old belief systems. You know, so if a baby every time it fell down, made a statement of, I'm not a walker, they would never walk. Because they would be using, I mean, because when she would say, Caden took a step, I don't know why she never mentioned the 30 falls he had. But it was because we weren't using the falling down to determine his identity. And that's what we do. You know, every time we make a mistake, we think we're a failure. What about the 20 times you succeeded last week? How come you don't call yourself a success? Why do you only use your negative experience to get your identity? It's because you're using your experience to get your identity, and you're not even supposed to do that. You're supposed to get your identity from the Word of God. Mm, wow. I can remember once asking God, you know, how come babies who are learning to walk aren't totally depressed? <laughs> you know, because in my way of thinking, you know, they should be totally depressed. It takes them, you know, like eight months just to get enough strength in their legs to stand holding on to something. 
And then they try to walk and not, you know, they fall down more than they, they walk. And so when I was asking God, you know, how come they're not depressed? And he said, because they do not get their identity from their past, they get their identity from their parents. They are so convinced that they can do what mom and dad do that they don't get depressed when they fail. And Say that again. Yeah, just, just. Babies are so convinced that they can do what mom and dad do that they don't get depressed when they fail. It doesn't mean anything to them. They just know mom and dad can do it. I know I can do this. And they're not using their failure as proof, which is what we tend to do. I prayed for three people and nobody got healed. I don't have the gift of healing. Well, I'm sorry, your daddy heals, so you can. You can do what your daddy does. You just have to be okay with the process and stop getting identity from failure. Get identity from the word of God. And that's where everything begins to change. And we stop looking for proof that I can't do that. I don't need to find proof that I can do this. God's word says I can. And I will. You know, I, I like to tell people, I haven't raised the dead yet, but I will because my daddy does. It's in my DNA to do. It's not something that I beg him to do. It's something he's put within me. Remember the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. It's not dwelling in you because it needs a place to live. <laughs> <laughs> it's dwelling in you to manifest life wherever you go. Hmm. <laughs> but we have to release it, believe in it, and just stop looking at the past. Just look at your daddy. Winston Churchill he said... Um, Success is moving from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. <laughs> Success is moving from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. And that's just what, that's what the, the toddler does. And, and there are examples. When Jesus said in, in Matthew 18, 3, he said, unless you're converted and become as a little child, you're not going to enter the kingdom there's many things about kingdom life that we can never enter into unless we adopt the attitude of a child. Unless we actually refuse to let failure, uh, you know, establish our identity. And where we don't look at failure as an identity, but just we look at it as learning. By the way, someone here tonight is getting free from the fear of failure. So, there, there's somebody tonight, something just happened to somebody. And, and literally, I just see just, there's just, just, just like you're getting on a launching pad. And, and the scaffolding is falling off. So, Can I just add one more thing? One of the things that really helped me in my journey <laughs> was God said, Wendy, I'm not asking you to do something you are not. And I think a lot of times when, you know, Scripture says, be holy as I am holy, he's not trying to get you as an unholy person to act holy. Right. That would just be mean. <laughs> <laughs> mean. <laughs> he's saying, you're my son and daughter, and therefore you are holy. He's trying to get you to live out of your identity and get it from him. So anything he's asking you to do, it's not something that is incongruent with your nature. You know, he, when we were raised from the dead and became butterflies, he's not asking us to pretend. He's not saying, you're still a butterfly, but I want you to pretend like you're a butterfly. I mean, he's not saying, you're still a caterpillar, but I want you to pretend to be a butterfly. He's actually trying to get you to believe you're a butterfly. And the Christian's journey isn't just to become better caterpillars. <laughs> you know, 
I, I spent way too long trying to do that, you know, jumping off leaves thinking I could fly. <laughs> you know, trying to do something I wasn't. And, but it really comes out of just beginning to know who you are. You're a whole new creation. So this joy celebrates progress. Now, it, joy is all over in the Bible. I mean, it's just amazing how once you actually see it, it's, it's one third of the kingdom. Hebrews 1 9, Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his companions. How I many you know a glad Jesus messes up a lot of people's theology? <laughs> Luke 2 10, the announcement. Uh, from the angels to the shepherds about baby Jesus was an announcement of joy. Behold, I bring you uh, good tidings of great joy. Say great joy. Great joy. So good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. That was the announcement of Jesus, was an announcement of joy. Joy is the second fruit of the Spirit in, in Galatians 5.22. It's, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. joy. It says in, in Psalm 16.11, it says, in His presence is fullness of what? We, not, we may not be outrageously joyful every time we're in His presence, but if we're never outrageously joyful in His presence, we may not be as much in His presence as we thought we were. Yeah, let's just laugh at that, by the way. <laughs> a chronic lack of joy is a representation of an incomplete God encounter. A chronic lack of joy is a representation of an incomplete God encounter. Now, joy, laughter is a weapon. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of, of strongholds. Now, it says weapons. And, and laughter is one of the weapons. Because to laugh, you have to let go of something. Laughter is a God-given way of actually letting go of bad beliefs, wrong attitudes. Uh, wrong, yeah, so... You know, and Winnie and I, we've been married 37 years. She was, we, we said we got saved as hippies, you know. She was my hippie girlfriend. And, <laughs> and you know, we, we've been married 37 years. So we love each other. We're best friends. But even so, we still don't always agree. Let's just laugh at that, by the way. <laughs> and, and when we're not agreeing, especially when I think she's really wrong, Nope, I'm not laughing. <laughs> I'm not letting go of this thing. Because if I laugh, you'll think things are okay around here. <laughs> things are not okay. I am a victim of you. <laughs> My joy in this home depends on your behavior. I can only be joyful here if you do what I think you should do. Nobody identifies with that at all. Matter of fact, I need everything lined up just right in my life for me to be joyful. I have to have all the people in my life doing what I think they should be doing. I can't have any financial pressures on my life for me to walk in joy. I can't have any unresolved relationship issues for me to have joy. I can't have any personal weaknesses happening in my life for me to have joy. And my government in Washington, D.C. needs to be doing what I think they should be doing <laughs> for me to have joy. And, it, and until those things, all those things line up, I'm not letting go of this thing. <laughs> going to punish everybody around me. Let them know they're the problem. And then when they change and circumstances change, then I'll be joyful. Yep, let's laugh it up. <laughs> the, the Lord said, uh, Steve, I've got news for you. Just, first of all, Steve, just take a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath. Steve, I've got news for you. If you're not joyful now, the chances of you being joyful in the future is slim. Because your lack of joy is not a, a circumstantial issue. It's actually a you issue. Hmm. Thank you, Lord, for that encouragement. <laughs> it always seems to boil back to me. 
You're always trying to remove the victim mentality off my life. You're always trying to get that thing out of there, huh? But Lord, I kind of like being a victim. Because when I walk as a victim, then I don't have to be responsible. <laughs> yeah. Somebody say amen or oh me. Man, on that one. Yeah, that's all. But to laugh, you have to, let, you have to let go of something. And one of the things that, you know, we, we have just found the revelation on is that we, to laugh, we can let go of, of bad beliefs and let go of lies. Because lies sound really real in the darkness of our thinking, but they're laughable when we bring them out to the light of language and words. Lies sound really real in the darkness of our thinking, but they're laughable when we bring them out to the light of language and words. It says in Psalm 2-4, he who sits in the heavens laughs. How many of you want to be more like God? Yes. Yeah. All right, I'm setting you up. <laughs> Thank you for raising your hand. <laughs> the question is, what's he laughing at in Psalm 2-4? Some, some say us. <laughs> Maybe true, but it's not the context. The context is God's laughing what his enemies are saying and his enemies are planning. And so I got an idea. I'm a spiritual experimenter. I've done things I've never, ever heard any other Christian do. And I got an idea. I said, if God's laughing at what the devil's saying and the devil's the father of all lies, then when I hear a lie, I'm going to laugh and I'm going to see what happens when I hear a, a lie in my own mind. So I want to bring you into my experiment. I'm going to share just some classic devil lies. And after I share each one, I would like you to laugh. Like you to laugh. Just let go. Through your laugh, just let go of any belief you have associated with that lie. You guys good? Yeah. Now, I'll say this. We, 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 don't, we, we realize we don't laugh all the time. We weep with those who weep. We mourn with those who mourn. We've pastored. We understand that. This this, is not a, this isn't something you're going to do all the time. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. So here we go. Let's laugh at this line. God is not going to provide for your needs in the future. Ha, 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 Not bad on the first one, but... By the way, on that one, let me just add a little extra on that one. Because his ability to meet your needs is dependent on how the economy is doing. <laughs> Some of you really let go of something there. That's good. I like it. I like that. Now, all right. Let's laugh at this slide. In key decisions that you will need to make in the future, you will not know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> let's give an extra laugh on that one. <laughs> Here's one. Uh, let's laugh at this line. Your prayers for America are not working at all. Ha <laughs> Here's another one. You are a failure. <laughs> I've got one. Oh, I want to hear this, Wendy. What is this? The negative things that people in my life are doing are more powerful than the positive things I'm doing. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a good lie. How about, how about this one? You are an insignificant person in the body of Christ. <laughs> Here's one. I, can't, I camped in this lie for about a decade. This is a, this is a classic lie. Here we go. Uh, there is something uniquely wrong with you. Ha, 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 ha,
<laughs> I, uh, I believe that for, <laughs> for about 10 years, just, just all that, that felt so true. And I mean, it just, uh, <laughs> the, the Lord says, uh, Steve, can I help you with that? I said, yes. He said, of course there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with everybody. That's why I sent Jesus. Get over it. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, just get over it. And here's one of the devil's all-time favorite lies. Laughter is of the devil. (laughs) (laughs) It's amazing how we don't even know what we're believing half the time. You know, we just, you know, like the, you, there's something uniquely wrong with me thing. Sometimes we haven't verbalized it, but we use that as a reason why we can't seem to change or get breakthrough or, you know, see something happen. It's like, you know, there's something so uniquely wrong with me that what Jesus did wasn't enough. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> And, and really, the only thing wrong with you is that you're trying to change without changing what you believe. That's the only thing. That's what changed everything for me. Because, like, for me, I always thought, well, I'm spiritually deaf. You know, how is God ever going to get me to do anything? Because I can't uh-huh. hear him. And when I do hear him, I, I have so much doubt. And that... He, he helped me by saying, you know, I will compensate for your deafness. <laughs> but what really helped was the day that I realized it's my belief that I'm deaf. Yep. That was hindering me. And I just needed to, to say, I hear God easily. Amen. And, and he does compensate for, you know, we're so afraid of the of the darkness of our spirit because we don't realize we're not the old man. And as long as your identity is still back there, you're not going to hear God. But you have a spirit that, you know, is seated in heavenly places. In Ephesians 2, it talks about it's not future tense. It's now. Therefore, your spirit knows more then your brain knows, because it's been there. It knows what's going on in heaven. It has a heavenly perspective. And we just have to learn to tap into hearing what our spirit is saying, believing it's easy because I'm spirit. I can hear spirit, because I am spirit. And just start declaring that you can, and something begins to shift, and you can do it more easily. The biggest thing is, is when we try too hard, and the reason we're trying too hard is because we're trying to do something we don't believe we are. When you really believe you are that, you don't have to try so hard. Just, it's very helpful to change what you believe first. So how do we know if, if we're believing a lie or if we're believing truth? I mean, that's, a, that's a pretty important question. I mean, Jesus said in, in John 8, 32, he said, the truth will make you free. So every area of our lives where we believe truth in, we get free. Every area of our life where we believe lies, we're not free. So I, if I believe truth about relationships, I get free in relationships. If I believe lies about relationships, I, I live in restriction and I'm not free. If I believe truth about finances, I get free about in finances. If I believe lies about finances and the things connected to that, I, I'm restricted in my financial experience. If I believe truth about the supernatural, I'll, I'll see the supernatural be released through me. If I believe lies about that, I'll be restricted. Now, so we, we get saved because we believe in Jesus. We have freedom because we believe like Jesus. We get saved because we believe in Jesus. We'll have freedom because we believe like Jesus. And so the, the focus uh, uh, of saying, okay, how do we know when we're believing a lie? Now, because the nature of deception is, is that we don't know we're deceived. 
How many know once you know you're deceived, you're no longer deceived? Thank you.